it's just here for a show then I guess yeah. yeah. how are you guys doing tonight my name is Dan and uh, I'm a naturalist here at ACES um, so I'd like to welcome all of you guys to uh, another edition of naturalist nights um, this is going to be our second last one so uh, next week we're going to be having our last natural study of the season so uh, you guys should definitely come back we're going to be talking about uh, the dipper as an e uh, indicator of river health and that's with Dee Malone so that's gonna be pretty exciting uh, before I introduce our speaker tonight I'd like to thank ACES as well as uh, the Roaring Fork Audubon Society and the Wilderness Workshop for putting together these talks we've been having some really great speakers uh, all season. Uh, also, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Two Leaves and a Bud for all the delicious tea that you guys are enjoying right now. Um, but on to our speaker for tonight. Uh, we are going to be hearing from Liesl Erb, and uh, she is originally from Idaho. She came here to Colorado originally um, to get her uh, bachelor's degree in biology from Colorado College. Uh, so right now she is a PhD candidate at uh, Colorado State University, uh, I'm sorry, University of Colorado Boulder, sorry. Go <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I knew it's I was okay. going to do that too. It's I said okay. it like three times. <laughs> <It's just teasing. laughs> um, so she's at the University of Colorado at Boulder uh, and she is doing research on pica. So she's going to be talking to us today about how uh, the climate change is impacting the pica. Um, so without further ado, why don't we give a warm welcome to our speaker tonight, Liesl Erb. Thanks so much, and, and no, no harm done. The Rams are great, too, but uh, if I had to choose, it'll be always, always buffs first. So, um, well, tigers, then buffs. Uh, thanks so much for having me. It's, it's really fun to be up here in Aspen. It's always great to have an excuse to, to come up into the, the core of the state um, mid when it's not my field season. So it's a lot of fun to be here, um, and I'm excited to share pikas with you. So here goes. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to show you as many cute pictures as possible. Feel free to say ah at, and, and how cute on any of them. We can all admit they're, they're stinking cute, so that's okay. I'm going to talk to you today about pikas and climate and what we've learned about them throughout the West over the past decade or so. So generally where we're headed today, not into the Songrays, unfortunately, uh, though this was one of my favorite, favorite spots that I've visited over the years. Um, but first of all, I just want to highlight some of the key points about climate change, what's going on, then uh, what's going on with climate change, generally speaking, then go into what is a pica. Um, most of you probably know that, but there are some common misconceptions there and why pikas might be vulnerable in the face of climate change. Then we'll go into actual um, patterns we're seeing throughout the West, extinction patterns, and places where they're doing okay, and try to figure out what, me and try to explain a little bit about what mechanisms are driving those patterns. And then a little bit about what you guys can do yourselves uh, to help the efforts to understand what's going on with pikas. Okay, so, um, Usually in an audience like this, most of you guys know climate change is happening. Um, what, what I want to highlight here, and let's see if my laser pointing pointing, there we go. Okay, what I want to highlight here, if you ever need that quick, you know, elevator speech about why climate change is happening, or why we know that it is definitely real and something that humans are doing is causing it, it's this slope. So the slope of a line, you're all probably skiers, or <laughs> you understand steep slopes, yes? So steeper slope here than in the past. When we look at a longer record past, you know, maybe the last 2,000 years or so, well, we can see, sure, there's a lot of noise. There is a lot of noise. Climate varies. The point is the rate at which climate is changing is more rapid than anything we've seen in, in any records. So that is the most important thing. Yes, climate changes all the time. Yes, there are huge vacillations in climate, but the sheer rate at which climate is increasing sure seems like that's not a completely natural process. All right, so the other thing is mostly when we t hear about climate change, it was first um, named or the name was first coined global warming, right? That's very mis misleading because we all know we're, we seem to be in one of the driest marches on record. That's weather, right? That's not climate. But if we get a bunch of dry, dry marches over time, that's an indication that climate might be changing, right? That's precipitation. So both temperature and precipitation are a really important part of the story. What, that, what you have here on these graphs, on the left here we have 
snowpack declines in the western U.S. Red indicates declines, blue indicates increases. What I want you to do is just sort of blur your eyes and squint. What you can see is that it's kind of pretty red up here and kind of purple over here, right? There's red and blue. That's what we call heterogeneity. That means stuff is not happening evenly across the landscape. Some places are getting wetter, some are getting drier. This isn't a concrete, everything's getting hotter, everything's getting drier situation. Some places are going to get wetter. Um, and the same, so this is just snowpack depth kind of thing, then the amount of, the amount of water in that snow is what's on, on the right here. And again, if you just squint your eyes, you can see the northwest red, Colorado purple. <laughs> Generally speaking, it's really patchy, and that's because we have mountains, right? Mountains can do crazy things to weather patterns and, and long-term climate patterns as well. So remember, climate change isn't just about temperature, and by the end of today, I hope you'll definitely know that. All right, now I'm an ecologist. That means I study the way the natural world, living things, interact with each other and interact with their environment, the climate, the soil, all of that. So the natural question for me to ask is how are animals, in my case, I'm a wildlife ecologist, how are they reacting to climate change? In this case, it's pikas. Now, there are basically three options for an animal or plant facing climate change. You can adapt. Now, the reason I brought this graph back is, again, remember that rate of increase. The problem is evolution happens at a pretty slow clip. <laughs> unless you're a microbe, unless you're, unless you're staff in a hospital, um, some kind of uh, microbe that's rapidly reproducing, you're not going to be able to adapt, evolve mutations, and that those mutations can't be selected upon in the time it is it will take to keep up with this kind of rate of change, right? So um, adaptation for a thing like a pica, not a super great option. Another thing you can do, though, is change your behavior, change your phenology, meaning the time you do things, what time you do things. Now, if you're cued into day length, for example, and that means some things like insect, certain insects, certain birds, it varies by species, will always come out on April 15th of every year. Not because they're scared of tax day, but because they just, the day length is a set amount of time, you know, they know when day length hits a certain, certain point and whatever they do to wake up happens on that day. A lot of things, though, are cued in on temperature, right? So what I want to point out here is you can see a general, again, a lot of noise, but a general trend downward here. What we see is over time, so this is years on the bottom, we see that the timing of certain species, spring arrival in birds, when flycatchers hatch, when beech trees leaf out, is happening earlier and earlier. All right, so what we see is things are changing the timing of when they do things. Okay, your third option, if you can't change your behavior, is to either die or move. <laughs> I guess that's three and four, options three and four. Um, ideally, but they both fall into distributional shifts. So a distributional shift can happen if you move upslope, for example, or it can happen if everybody dies downslope. <laughs> Same net product is things are only living upslope. Hmm, no, I don't want to connect to a wireless network, but thank you. <laughs> Computers try to be so helpful in the middle of things. Okay. Um, now, what, what I want you to see here is this is a study uh, that was published in Nature, and it's a bunch of species from Yosemite National Park. And what I want you to see mainly is that the gray parts, the hashed parts of these, each of these species was their range back in Grinnell's day when he was surveying Yosemite at the turn of the century. Now, things that have red mean that they contracted either uphill or downhill or both in the case of this species right here. It contracted to this tiny little area right here. Other things expanded upward. So in some cases, climate change is great. You can move uphill and life is, life is grand because you're a, down, you're a lower elevation species. For others, they're contracting upwards and the thing is eventually we run out of mountain, right? Um, at least on this continent that we bottom out at, well, we we hit the ceiling at about 14,000 feet, um, so that's rough. So, now let's talk about pikas a little bit. Oh, so cute. This was a juvenile, so they're particularly cute. Now, the first misconception about pikas is that they're rodents. 
Rodents are mice and um, squirrels and rats and marmots, actually. But pikas are closely related to rabbits and hares. They're their own family group, okay? So there are a few things that, may, that are characteristic about them that um, is clued into the, cued into the fact that they are lagomorphs, rabbits and hares. So again, they're not a rodent. Um, if you're ever not sure if something is a pika or a marmot, and I know you guys live up here, you probably have a better sense, but remember, football, baked potato, okay? <laughs> football, baked potato. Now, <laughs> all right? So keep that in mind. The other thing, if you hear a call, whistle, high-pitched whistle, dog squeaky toy. All right? Eh, 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 eh. Down here, that's what they sound like. That's the southern dialect. Um, they're a little bit <laughs> eh, 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 up in the northern Rockies, all right? I will, only, I, I will not be doing any more of that for now, but I usually get asked to, so I figured I would just do it unsolicited. All right, so football and whistle, um, dog squeaky toy and potato. Just keep that in mind. But they do live in very similar areas. All right, some little known facts about pikas. There are actually 30 species worldwide, but 28 of them are in Asia. All right. All the, place, all the niches filled by ground squirrels here in North America, so think prairie dog, think um, all sorts of prairie ground squirrels and the ground squirrels you see in the, you know, the cute, um, even our chipmunks or the, uh, oh, the ground squirrel that I'm forgetting right now. Anyway, they, all those um, ground squirrels, their niches are filled by pikas. There are basically prairie dogs, you would mistake them for prairie dogs in Asia on the Tibetan Plateau. They live in colonies, they're social, they live in colonies, they burrow under the ground, they, they're prairie dog, you know, they seem like they're prairie dogs, and yet, in fact, they're pikas. So that's pretty cool. There are so many pikas in Asia. They span all the way into Afghanistan. We hope they're still there. They live in the mountain regions where some other folks are hanging out right now. Um, but they... Um, they are very amazing. The radiation of pikas in, in Asia is incredible. There are only two species here, and here are their distributions. The collared pika is in Alaska and the Yukon, whereas the American pika, which is what I'll be talking about today, is here. It reaches up into the Canadian Rockies along the, um, the, ca in, in the Cascades. That's kind of the northern range, the northern edge of their range, and they come down into New Mexico and the southern Sierra Nevada. There are actually five subspecies of the American pika, and you can see them outlined here. So what's interesting is right here in Colorado, we actually have two subspecies. That seems like a funny break, right? What the heck causes a break right there? Well, glaciers cause that. <laughs> um, so in the past, last ice age, there was a big boundary right here uh, that pikas couldn't cross. So that subspecies is pretty distinct. And so when I talked about the dialects of pikas, it's, uh, you can... I can tell when I walk into a population which side of this barrier I'm on. Um, it's no longer a barrier, but still you, you hear the dialects and it uh, goes along with their subspecies. Okay, part of an important thing is uh, about pikas being lagomorphs, not rodents, is that they don't hibernate. Now, not all rodents hibernate either. Actually, prairie dogs don't hibernate, but rodents do, including marmots and a lot of ground squirrels and other squirrels do hibernate. These guys don't. So the problem is if you're an herbivore, you eat plants, you live in the alpine, and you don't go to sleep in the winter, you've got to have a food source, right? Well, they stock the pantry. That's what a hay pile is. They collect plants all summer long, stuff them into rocks so that they can feed off of it all winter long. Pretty clever. Uh, they're, very, they're very amazing. They'll, they'll, um, they're generalists, so they'll collect everything from aspen leaves to grasses to wildflowers to conifers spruce and pine piles as well. And these hay piles can be very, very large. This is my dad next to a hay pile. Um, and here's another amazing picture of a pika and its hay pile. Pretty amazing. They are uh, very busy little, little guys throughout the summer. <coughs> All right, these guys here in the Rockies, they're a high elevation obligate. They have to live above around nine or 10,000 feet because of their climatic constraints. They're really sensitive to high temperatures. And by high, I mean over 78 degrees. 
We're not talking very high temperatures. Uh, they overheat and die. If you think about it, it's basically that to stay warm and awake and functioning all winter long, they have to have a really high metabolism that they can't shut off in the summer. So they're right at that ma they're at thermal maximum where they can overheat really, really quickly because they're already burning s their energy so fast. Um, but they also tend to, they always live in, in talus. Now that's an interesting thing. Talus is broken rock. Think of the difference between scree and talus. Scree is the stuff that slides under your feet when you're at the top of a 14er. Um, it's usually the little stuff, smaller than about um, a few inches in diameter. Talus is the big stuff. It's the big, chunky rock that you can kind of get solid ground on, solid footing. Um, that's important. Pikas don't want their home sliding down um, the mountain. They also need to have the holes in between the rocks. The rocks have to be big enough for them to fit in, into. And they also stuff their hay in there. And the thing about talus is it serves as an amazing microclimate. Um, it can be up to 30 degrees cooler underneath the talus than it is on the surface. Uh, so if you don't like temperatures over 78 degrees, it's a good idea to live in talus. Go figure. All right, and just what I wanted to point out here is this study that was in Yosemite. There's the pica right here. So it, um, in this study, they found that their distribution was shifting up in elevation slightly, about 153 meters in the last century. All right, so let's get down to brass tacks. How could climate change cause extinction for pikas? Um, so this, is, this was developed by Chris Ray, my co-advisor. You'll hear, hear a lot about her today. Um, but this is a little schematic. So there are some direct effects, obviously. They overheat. But I'm an ecologist, which means I study all the interactions. Here are all the different ways pikas could possibly be affected by climate change. It could affect their food. It could affect their competitors in the form of marmots. It could affect... Um, diseases, for example, wood rats are moving up in elevation and they're lousy buggers. They're covered in, <laughs> covered in fleas and ticks and bringing diseases with them sometimes. I love wood rats. They're adorable, but um, they do carry diseases. So various things. And predators could be affected as well. Now that predator is drawn that way because the main predator of pikas is the weasel. Think of that nice, thin, lithe body that can go in between those crevices in the rocks and follow a pika. A coyote doesn't have a chance, right? So number one um, predator are mustelids in general, weasels and martens, actually. Here's, you know, it's pretty remarkable that they catch them, but they do. Um, but given ha the size differences, um, it's a pretty big prey item, but weasels are amazing predators. I wouldn't want to meet one in a dark alley. Um, <laughs> so, okay, now if we want to know how climate is affecting pikas, we first have to know where pikas are and ideally know where they used to be and if that has changed, right? If their distribution has changed. Are they gone from places where they used to be? So to get at where they are now, you can survey potential pika habitat. You can go out and find talus that's above certain elevations and um, find where the pikas are and document that. But that doesn't tell you if they've disappeared necessarily, right? So the great thing we can do is look through historical records, find places where pikas were documented in the past, and revisit those places to see if they're still there. So I'm going to talk about um, various studies that have done one or both of these over the next few minutes. Um, and when I say that we document pikas, we document it through those distinctive calls. If you hear a pika, you know it's a pika. So that counts as pikas are present. Also, seeing them specifically, since they're like the terriers of the small mammal world, they think they're way bigger than they are. They come out on a rock and tell you to get out of their territory. Um, you usually can see them pretty, pretty easily if you're looking. Um, and of course, those hay piles are really conspicuous. So those are also signs. All right, so the first study I want to tell you about is the broadest uh, spatial scale. This is throughout the West. What you see here is uh, 16 different national parks throughout the West that have pikas. Um, of those 16, eight were selected for a two-year study to document where, how much of their pika habitat, potential pika habitat, was actually inhabited by pikas. So you can see Crater Lake, Lava Beds, Lassen National Park. Um, then we got Craters of the Moon, Yellowstone and Teton, and then here in Colorado, Rocky Mountain National Park and Great Sand Dunes. Those were selected. Um, sand dunes, yeah. So it, the funny thing is the, sand, the national park itself is just the dunes, but the national monument 
is a big chunk of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, and it's beautiful pica habitat. So here we go. Here are the proportions of pica habitat that were actually occupied in 2010. And what I generally want you to see is Idaho and California here were pretty low compared to Oregon and the Rockies, right? We had a lot more pikas in those regions. Okay, now I'm going to focus on three specific studies and study areas. The Great Basin, the Sierra Nevada, and the Southern Rockies. So in this map, the red hashed area is, pica is the American pika's distribution. I'm going to start in the Great Basin here. Okay, this is kind of hard to see, don't worry, I'm going to zoom in on it. What you want to know is, mainly I want to point out the Great Basin is the basin between the bathtub edge that is the Sierra Nevada and the Rocky Mountains. In between you have a basin. Now you have some mountain ranges that poke up within that basin. And long ago, these yellow, dot, uh, yellow dots indicate um, fossil records of pikas. But the red and blue points indicate places where pikas were in the last century. So let's zoom in. There are 25 locations. There are 25 red or blue stars or circles. Don't worry about this distinction right now. That were occupied sometime between 1898 and 1990. As of 1990, sorry, as of 1999, six of them had gone extinct. And those are all pointed to by red arrows here. Six of them had lost their pikas. Less than 10 years later, four more had lost their pikas. And so we were up to 10 of them lacking pikas. So we're 10 out of 25 extirpated, which means pikas are gone, right? And what you notice is it maybe took 100 years for the first six to go extinct. In less than 10, another four went extinct. So that rate is increasing, which is certainly a concern. Now the other thing that, um, this, this work was done by Eric Beaver, who works for the U.S. Geological Survey, in conjunction with my advisor, Chris Ray, um, and a fellow grad student, Nifer Wilkening. Um, another thing they found in this research in the Great Basin was that elevational shifts were happening here too. So as of around 1933, the average lowest elevation of pica populations was around 2,300 meters, 2,400 meters. When Eric went out and did his uh, surveys in oops, 1999, what we, he saw was they had moved up 100 meters. 2008, they had moved up another 100 meters. So again, we're talking about a rate change. It took about 100 years for them to get that first 100 meters uphill, but within less than 10 years, they had moved even farther up. So, Again, it's a concern. And this, of course, is not a peak in the Rockies. Uh, some of you might recognize it, mountaineers. Um, but this is an 8,000-meter 8, peak in Asia. Uh, we don't have those here. So as they're marching uphill again, potentially, uh, they could run out of mountain, unfortunately. OK, so investigating what actually predicts extinction, what, what was it about those six and then the additional four sites that made them lose their pikas? Well, usually we suspect in any, for any species, maybe the amount of habitat wasn't great for them. There just wasn't a lot of talus. Or maybe the talus wasn't good talus. It wasn't as deep as some other places. Maybe um, humans, roads, trails, that kind of thing were affecting them. Maybe other species were affecting them. Or again, maybe it's climate. Um, so, so Eric and company investigated a lot of these things. They looked at, um, that's pretty much this uh, more specific um, list of what I just mentioned. And here's what they found. Okay, the, a big upside down pica means <laughs> not good. Um, <laughs> it means the worst thing for pikas, the places that, where pikas were lost were those that had a lot of cold days, intense cold days. This meant below negative 10 degrees Celsius, which is roughly 14 degrees. Now, if you think about it, the fir your first reaction might be, pikas live in the Alpine. Of course they deal with that all the time. But they don't. OK, survival 101, you're in the forest, you're stuck, and it's snowing. How do you stay warm? Build a snow cave. Pikas live in a snow cave. At least they're supposed to. They live underneath, often, feet of snow. So they're constantly insulated from 
um, from those intense cold days. These measured cold days were measured on data loggers that, that these guys put under the talus. So th that meant the cold was actually reaching through the snow. There wasn't enough snow. This is an indicator of lack of snowpack and lack of insulation. All right? So just because you live in the Alpine doesn't mean you like it really, really cold. Um, one thing they found that was good for pikas was having some place to run, <laughs> some place uphill. If they were already at the highest elevation point, they usually were gone by 2008. If, though, there was a little saddle and then there was more accessible habitat that they could get to within three kilometers or so, they were okay. That usually, more than anything, often it means there's a healthy population higher up that sends babies, colonists, down to keep that population going. So that was good. Um, also bad for pikas was summer temperature, average summer temperature. The hotter, the worse it was for pikas. All right. And, um, Area and grazing were actually not particularly important, so it doesn't seem like cattle or sheep are really affecting pikas too badly. Let's go over to the Sierra Nevada now. Now, this is a really interesting area. I'd be happy to tell you more about it, but Bodie, California, is an area that was a, an old mining town that's full of mine tailings. Mine tailings look a lot like talus. You got crevices to hide in. You, got, you can stuff your hay in it. Pikas think that's great. They actually build hay piles in the, in the mine tailings, and in the 70s, life was great for them. They were all over the place in this area. And what you can see here is a lot of green dots in 1972. Those are all places where pikas were. Now we zoom into 2008, what you can see is all the green dots in the southern part of the study area have now lost their pikas, and a large number of those dots up in the northern area have lost pikas as well. Pikas are disappearing from Bodhi, basically. All right, so that was a quick skip over to Sierra Nevada. Now we'll focus on the southern Rockies, the area I know best. Um, and let's think about what it is about the southern Rockies that makes it good pika habitat. Now, the Great Basin, remember I described it as a bathtub with some mountain ranges poking up. What that means is there's not a lot of habitat overall, right? There, and there are deep valleys that are hot. We're talking Nevada here. Deep, dry valleys in between those mountain ranges that make it pretty tough for pikas to move in between them. So there's, there's uh, those pi pika populations are isolated from one another. If, if a population blinks out, on one mountain, it may not be able to be recolonized. In the Rockies, we've got passes, our, you know, our low points are at 11 or 12,000 feet. No problem for a pika. So they can be recolonized because random stuff happens. Diseases hit. Um, for whatever reason, a, pi a population might blink out, we call it. But if it's connected, it can be recolonized. So we would think that due to the sheer higher elevation nature of this area and the fact that they're connected between high elevation passes, that pikas should be okay a little bit better here. And what that means is if pikas are doing poorly here, we really have a problem, <laughs> all right? But if they're doing okay here, then maybe this will serve as a refuge if, as, as things change over the coming decades. Okay, so here's what I found. So my dissertation work is investigating the southern Rockies, um, which is defined as all the way from Laramie, Wyoming, down to Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I cut it off at the Colorado border just for ease of transportation. Uh, and this was a lot of sites to cover, so I have to say the Division of Wildlife was amazing. They helped out with this project. Um, they visited about half of these, and I visited about half of them. In all, there were 69 sites that we visited. They were all historically occupied sometime between 1896 and 1980. Um, and it was great news in 2008. Pikas were at almost all of them. 65 of 69 still had their pikas. But we did have these four little populations that were lacking pikas, and they had them in the past. So that was interesting. So I've continued, um, I, I've, I did four field seasons. I couldn't, con I couldn't continue that kind of effort. Um, so we focused on about 30 sites in uh, 2009 through 2011. And what we found, we certainly kept those four absences so that we could pay attention and see if they were recolonized or if they continued to lack pikas. And I'm glad I did that 
because when we re went back in 2009, these two sites still lacked pikas, but these two had been recolonized. In the case of this one, there was a pika that seemed to know what it was doing. It was haying and all of that. In the case of this guy in Wyoming, it was um, really confused. It was putting hay on top of rocks and all over the place and seemed like it wasn't doing great, but it was a pika and it was doing its thing. So that counts as a recolonization, so that was really exciting. So what we saw in 2009 was 90% of the sites were occupied. In 2010, we went back to all of these and unfortunately, the little confused fellow did not make the winter. Um, his hay supply didn't look like it, it would last him. So I wasn't surprised, but it's a really sad thing um, to have seen them the year before and, and know that they didn't make it. So that dropped us down to 88% occupied in 2010. 2011, last year, we went out. This, these three remained the same as 2010. In fact, this population right here, which is in Rocky Mountain National Park, this last summer had a booming population. It has finally taken hold, and there were, I was able to collect seven scat samples. If you want to know why I pick, pick up poop, we can talk later. Um, <laughs> I was able to pick up seven scat samples from this population, which is, indicates there were at least that many individuals there, and I knew that two years later nobody was there. So that's really exciting. Uh, they do have the ability to, to take over again. Uh, but these two new populations lost their pikas in 2011. So we were down to 82%. So now again, the question is why? Why are they disappearing? Well, again, there could be some habitat features like the talus isn't deep enough. So the basement, you can think of it as the basement isn't cold enough, essentially, if it's not deep enough. Um, there could be subtalus water sources. A lot of times there snow, there is uh, permafrost under talus, actually. Um, it could be vegetation, and again, it could be precipitation. So I tested all those things. And what I found was it was all about the precipitation. Um, in fact, so what I want you to see here is on the x-axis we have mean annual precipitation. We have really dry sites here, and they all have zeros for no pikas. And all these wetter sites up to, look at this, up to 1,400. That's a foot, I mean, that's a meter, almost a meter and a half. Of, we're not talking snow. This is, this is precipitation. This is moisture. That's a lot, a lot. That's Crested Butte, by the way. <laughs> um, anyway, so the dry sites lacked pikas. Hmm. In 2009, remember those two sites were recolonized? It was the two slightly wetter sites that were recolonized. These two really, really, really dry sites are those that have been lacking pikas all four years that I've visited. Now what's interesting is in 2010, in my models, temperature started to creep in. Suddenly temperature was mattering as well to why pikas were there or not. And in 2011, with those two new sites that, were, that lost their pikas, they were really wet sites that were really hot. So suddenly temperature is raising its ugly head. And again, remember, climate change is about both precipitation and temperature. So it certainly seemed like both of these matter. So let's look at them really quickly. What we have is over the years, red bars are the absences, blue bars are the presences. Every single year, temperature, I mean, sorry, in this case, precipitation was much, much lower at all the absences. And similarly, all the absences were significantly hotter than the, the locations that still had their pikas. So this indicates that both precipitation and temperature are playing a role. Now I want to really briefly talk about though, there are some really hot sites that have pikas. This is one, Valles Caldera, New Mexico. If any of you have been there, you know it's amazing. For those of you that haven't, it's a fascinating place. It's a caldera. It's a prehistoric volcano that cl collapsed in on itself. And it has these, they call them felsenmeres, rivers of rock that are talus, but they are the deepest talus I have ever seen. Um, I've lost countless things in this talus. I can't tell you how deep it is. Luckily, my data sheet is just the category is greater than 1.5 meters deep. That's just greater than 1.5 meters deep. I don't know. There could be some sea monster living down there for all I know. It is deep. Um, and so this is an area where 
Even though it's hot on the surface, really, really good talus provides a microclimate that allows pikas to survive. So even though we're talking really, really hot temperatures in the summer, they can hide underneath and never, and never be affected by that. So that's pretty great. Um, this does have water running underneath these rock slides. Um, the rock is porous that we think potentially would make it more insulative. And it's a nice gentle slope and it's very deep. Okay, now let's get down to, so we've talked about populations disappearing, right? How does that happen? Well, it happens because pikas die. Um, individuals die. So my advisor, Chris Ray, has been studying at this gorgeous site outside of Bozeman, Montana for over 20 years. She's been studying pika survival dynamics. And um, in the last few years, she's been, she has started, this is Chris, that was her in the 80s. Um, she is sexing a pika here. Um, if you ever come up to me and say, I saw the most amazing female pika, I'll say, you don't know it. You have to flip them upside down and, and kind of violate them to find out what they are. Um, now, that's, that's not entirely true. Males make a special call in a certain part of the mating season, but, um, so that's our only clue, but often we have no idea if they're a male or a female. They behave exactly the same way in the talus. They're equally territorial. Um, so what she's done, here's her in a more recent picture, she has compared her study site in Montana to her study site in Colorado to see if, if she can really look at how climate is affecting survival in different places throughout the Rockies. So she not only is looking at our pica, individual pikas surviving from one year to the next, but also what are their stress levels. You can actually, by taking some, uh, a blood sample from a pica, you can tell if they're stressed. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Okay, so look at how cute they are. Um, this little guy was, um, was trapped, and the way that she can determine survival is she puts an ear tag that has a unique marker. It's a color-coded marker. Um, and pikas set up shop. Uh, they disperse once in their life. They are born. They spend about a month with their, with their mother, and then they are kicked out and treated like a stranger from then on and have to find their own territory. That territory that they do find is uh, their territory for life. So when we talk about pikas moving to another mountain range, we mean their juveniles will disperse. That's how they move. An individual pika won't say, oh, it's getting hot in here, I better move. That's not going to happen. But they might have offspring that would head to higher ground. And so when we talk about pikas moving, it has to happen generation by generation. Again, not a great system if you're facing such rapid change. Um, but anyway, so an individual, once it's in its territory, is there for life. So Chris can tag it in its territory. She traps them by using their own hay. It's very evil. But, 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 but um, pikas are fastidious little creatures. And you, the best way to get a shot of a pika haying is to take some of its hay out of its hay pile and put it on a rock. And they'll go, how did that get there? <laughs> they grab it. Now, Chris taught this to David Attenborough. If you've seen the pika shot on, on um, Life of Mammals, Chris Ray taught David Attenborough how to get a pika haying on video. Don't let, it, don't let him tell you otherwise. Um, so anyway, she's able to put their hay into a trap and catch them that way. Um, and then the next year, she just looks to see if that territory has a pika that has the ear tag. Now, sometimes the ear tag's been ripped out, but she can say, okay, clearly there was a tag in there. Um, so anyway, that's how she determines survival. And what I want you to see here, this is the Colorado site on Niwot, Niwot Ridge. It's the long-term research set, um, station for University of Colorado. And uh, what you can see here is a lot of red dots and only five green ones. Only five pikas survived between the summer of 2008 and the summer of 2009 in Colorado. That's abysmal. Um, what I want you to see here is in Montana, survival in that same interval was around 60%, which is pretty average, pretty normal. These guys only live uh, two to three, maybe four years. Um, the oldest pika, I think, was seven. Um, but usually they're around three or four. So 60% survival is nice and normal. In Montana, that was great. In Colorado, it was around 11%. Horrible. Um, and what she noticed, interestingly, was that none of the pikas on north-facing slopes survived, which is not intuitive, right? 
but some on the south-facing slopes did. Now, that's not intuitive if you're thinking about um, snow melting, maybe, and the, that, or the fact that southern slope, south-facing slopes might be, uh, get more intense solar radiation in the summer and might be hotter. But Niwot Ridge, I would argue, is one of the windiest places on Earth. So the thing about Niwot Ridge and north and south-facing slopes is this is probably an indication of snow collecting more on south-facing slopes than it does on north-facing slopes because of wind patterns more than anything else, actually. So it doesn't have to do with insulation or the radiation from the sun as much as it does snow, snow patterns. Um, now, the interesting thing, too, is that here is that is plasma glucose is one way you can measure stress in animals. And um, what you see here is, so higher, glucose, higher plasma glucose means more stress. Colorado pikas are stressed out. <laughs> what is stressing them out? Well, this is kind of a confusing graph, but I want you to focus on these areas right here. The dashed line is Colorado. The solid line is Montana. So these two shoulders, I want you to notice that the proportion of temperatures that were below negative 10 degrees or above, say, 15 degrees Celsius is much higher in Colorado. That means there are more hot days and really cold days. Again, this is subtalus temperatures, OK? So pikas are getting stressed out in the summer and the winter. It's too hot in the summer, and, it's not, and there's not enough snow. The dang wind on Niwot Ridge, especially, is not providing the insulation that pikas need in the winter. So they're getting a double whammy here. Here's another way to look at that. So this is a lot of data, but what you see here is red is um, data points. The red points are data points from data loggers under the talus in Montana, and the blue are Colorado. What you see is in the winter, so here we're talking November through February, March, there is not snow insulating. See how Montana baseline kind of hits zero degrees and stays there? That's because snow hits, and z remember, zero is the equivalent of 32 Fahrenheit. It just stabilizes. It's right around freezing. There is nothing insulating here in Colorado, and so they're dropping, their pikas are experiencing these extreme cold events. They're also, in the early spring especially, experiencing really hot events. So they're really getting a double whammy, potentially before they can even really hay. The, the plants don't really come out in, in full bore until late June, or, uh, late June or so. So they're just being kind of frozen in the winter and, and fried in the summer, potentially. And uh, this is what a data logger looks like. It's just a little box. It's, it's a tiny little thing that we can put under the talus and find out a lot. It's pretty cool. OK, so let's get back to this diagram. How could climate be affecting pikas? Well, we've talked a little bit about this here, about a few of these. But mainly, here's our working hypothesis as of right now. We know summer and winter, somehow those are interacting. Temperature and snow are interacting. Well, we know there's summer heat stress. All right, pikas don't like it over 78 degrees. Well, if, they, if it's over 78 degrees above the talus, they're going to stay underneath the talus. Now, what are they supposed to be doing? Haying. So the problem with hiding from the heat is that you reduce your hay pile size. That's all well and good if it's an easy winter. If it's a really cold winter and your metabolism has to really be ramp ramped up because you're experiencing these intense cold punches, right? You're going to need a big hay pile and you're not getting it. So they end up stressed and with an inferior food source in the winter because of summer stress. So those, that double-edged sword, right? Summer and winter, temperature and precipitation. This is our working hypothesis. We're, gonna, we're getting at trying to directly test this. Uh, this summer, I have an undergrad that's going to be timing pikas, how much time they spend above and below ground at certain temperatures. So uh, that'll be fun. Great job for enthusiastic 19-year-olds. Um, so sad little pika turns upside down. OK, so I do want to point out that um, pikas are an interesting species to study. Don't go running out and saying, necessarily, all the pikas are dying. Uh, there are a lot of them declining, and this is a major concern. In the southern Rockies, that proportion of sites occupied is marching downward. The thing is, 
Pikas are what we call a metapopulation species. That means that there's a patch over here and a patch over here, and one of them might blink out and it'll get rescued by babies that are born over here. They colonize again, again, as long as you're not in the Great Basin where you can't recolonize. Um, it's a pretty good system. They can be okay for a long time in the Rockies as long as they're high elevation populations that have a lot of snow. I guarantee pikas will be at Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. I know Ian Billick was here last week. Uh, they'll be there for a long time. Uh, that place is pika heaven. Um, and because they get feet and feet and feet of snow, and it is blissfully cool all winter long and all summer long. Um, so there are places in the Rockies that will serve as refuges. And remember the blue dots that made Colorado purple in that early, earlier um, graph? There are places getting wetter in Colorado, too. So it's not that all pikas might be dying. The entire species might go extinct. The reality is we're, gonna, we're losing populations. Some of them will, be, will rebound. The Great Basin doesn't have a good setup for rebounding. So those populations are in serious trouble. Um, so just know that they do. They, they might be able to rescue themselves in some places. Now, populations do have to be monitored. And I want to um, direct you guys to a new project we have going called Science Live. So Science Live is a pet project of my husband's and mine. And you can access the website through cumuseum.colorado.edu slash science live. And that's case sensitive. We're working on that. But right now, you've got to have all the capitals right. Um, anyway, and, and on this website, I'll show you a few of the things you can do. Um, we, I actually have all my 69 sites up on a Google map. And if you click on a point, you can find out what the average precipitation is there, whether, what, whether pikas are there or not. You can find out uh, distance to trail, all sorts of stuff about these sites. You can also, we're working on other species. We'll eventually have butterflies and other species as well. Um, but you can also see a lot of wonderful pictures of pikas, of course. Um, you can find out more about pikas. If you click on any of these, it tells you information about pikas that you might be looking for. And if you see there are these buttons here, follow a pika scientist, be a pika scientist, and pikas in the classroom. Um, to follow a pika scientist, we've actually done some video blogs of us in the field. This is actually at Rocky Mountain Biological Lab, well above it, on Mount Gothic. Um, this was an evil pika that decided to uh, stuff thistle all around, my all around my data logger. <laughs> and I did not have gloves, and I was not, not very happy with it. Uh, but, the, but it's a beautiful sight. Look, you guys are right over here. The, here. I think those are the maroon bells in the background. Um, Anyway, so you can look at videos and follow us on both written and video blogs here. You can ask us questions and we'll answer them. Um, also, if there are any educators in the audience, of course, obviously, many of you are. Um, ACES is a, is a wonderful educational place. So um, that we actually have lesson plans for various age groups ranging from fourth grade through high school. We have uh, right now, three different lesson plans set up based on our research where you can actually use the data that's online. Um, one of the state standards is to use actual data. And teachers kind of go, OK, <laughs> great, how do I get that? So we're trying to make that data available for teachers to use. Um, and also, here's the final thing. You can be a pika scientist. So if you want to be a casual pika scientist, you can use something called the American Pika Atlas. This is through iNaturalist.org where you can actually, if you see any species in the field of any sort, you can take a picture of it. And now these days, fancy phones, which I don't have, but the, the fancy phones, uh, you can take a picture and even record the coordinates, right? A lot of them have GPSs now, too. If you have GPS coordinates and a picture of the species, you can upload it onto iNaturalist, and, um, and it will show up as a point on the map. And you actually can help. In the case of the American Pika Atlas, we're trying to document pikas in all the counties that are within that range boundary that you saw earlier. We're trying to show that, figure out which counties they're still in. So by hiking anywhere you might go, up the Maroon Bells, anywhere, any wilderness area, just take a picture of a pika. Again, wait. If you just sit and wait, they're going to get annoyed with you and want you out of their territory. And they'll come on top of a rock, I promise. So just sit and wait, and they'll come out, snap a picture, record your coordinates, upload it to the American Pika Atlas, and you're good to go. Usually you can just use a Google or a Facebook or a Twitter account that's already established if you have one of those. 
and create your account with American Pika Atlas. So it's a pretty cool way to just, when you're hiking, help contribute to the science so we know where pikas are. Um, and if you're more, uh, more dedicated and want to have a mission and maybe adopt a pika site that you can visit all the time, we have two, um, two efforts going in the state of Colorado. One's based in Denver and one's based in Durango and Silverton out of the Mountain Studies Institute. And it's called the Pika Patrol or the Front Range Pika Project and PikaNet. So you can um, join up with one of these websites. So again, if you just go to the Science Live website, you can get all this information. But um, you can sign up. You actually get trained to be a Pika Patrol volunteer. You go to a set site, and you can record whether pikas are there. And a lot of those things, like I said, how deep is the talus? That's important to us. We train you how to figure that out. So you collect all those data for us. And it goes into, um, in, you enter it into a website. And then we can actually process that and use it for our analyses. So it's a great way for citizen scientists to get involved and directly connect to our work. So if anybody's interested in getting involved in that way, please let me know or check out the website. Um, so I just want to thank folks that have personally funded my own work, as well as helped me hike to all these beautiful but often challenging places. Um, again, the Division of Wildlife has been amazing. Lots of people helped me tramp around on their land. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Mm -hmm. I've been watching pikas for 25 years, but one of the best places to drive close to and see pikas, I couldn't believe that I probably the best population of pikas I've seen in the last 10 years, Loveland Pass, west side of the pass, you just walk about 10 minutes, and it was in September, they were hanging and doing, mm -hmm. but I got incredible pictures yeah. with a point and shoot. And I mean, that is as close to civilization as I've ever Absolutely. seen. Absolutely. Because Independence Pass, mm -hmm. you don't have pikes close to the pass. Right. And I know other passes you don't. Once yeah. I walk over. So I just wanted to share that. And then I just had two quick questions. One was, um, you had mentioned predators, and you mm -hmm. had, but I would like to know the other predators, yeah. not just the main predator. Mm -hmm. And then the other question was, um, about, uh, oh, do they go into torpor at all, or are they awake the whole time? Okay, great. So uh, predators of pikas, generally speaking, so weasels number one, generally speaking, the second best predator for them, um, well, not for them, <laughs> not good for them, is uh, birds of prey. Usually, um, uh, we're not sure how often owls get them. We hear pikas calling at night. I have, sometimes I'm able to camp next to my sites and I hear them calling, I think they're haying. It's a, there's a theory that um, pikas are actually, in some places, adapting to hot daytime temperatures by haying more at night because it's cooler. The problem with that is owls are silent and deadly. So we don't know how often owls get them, we suspect that they do, but we do know that hawks um, are a good predator and you can always tell one of the ways I know a, a, a population is really dead and gone is when a bird of prey flies over and nobody nobody chirps um, because usually they will they will call um, if they see that um, so birds of prey generally speaking pikas go down to about 10,000 feet and things like rattlesnakes stop at about 10,000 feet so they don't interact very much, but certainly I would think, you know, I always get worried at some of my sites that are around 8,000 that a snake could be in that. Snakes like, like holes in rocks as well, so I would imagine snakes. Um, coyotes do get them. Juvenile pikas are really, really kind of silly and dumb. Um, they panic when they see you, so I've, had, I've seen them. They panic and turn around and run and smack, strack and st smack straight into a rock. Um, it's okay, they, they kind of are dazed and they pop up. And I'm not a coyote, so I don't eat them, but a coyote would take advantage of that second of dazed and confused uh, pi juvenile pika. So generally speaking, coyotes can only catch the kind of dumb ones. Uh, but um, yeah, so that's kind of the list of predators. And they don't, as far as we know, they don't go into any kind of torpor. Uh, but to be honest, pikas are nearly impossible to hold in a lab. Uh, they stress incredibly easily. You'll never see them in a zoo. Um, because they just stress out. There was a lab um, in Fort Collins that had a bunch of pikas and they were doing physiological work on them just to test their, their me metabolism. 
and uh, somebody brought a dog into the room next door, into the room next door, and they all had little mini pica heart attacks and died. So they, they died. They just, they're, they're little stress balls. They can't handle anything. So, um, so we don't, we, there, we would love to know more about pica physiology, um, and it can be pretty challenging to study. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes. One more question for the TV, please. Okay. Yes. I have a question. You say that they die of heart attacks and stuff like that. Do you think that any of your scientists that are screwing around when giving blood transfusions and poking into the holes have anything to do with population disease? That's a good question. So, so the question was, are the scientists that are trapping them and taking blood from them, are they affecting the stress levels of pikas? And are they affecting, potentially killing them because of that? Um, what we do know, so we've um, measured their stress levels. The cool thing about stress is that, um, and stress hormones in the blood, is that it peaks slightly after the stressful event. So um, we've actually studied, we've looked at the stress of an individual when you first catch it, um, as opposed to after, you know, a ways after it's been caught at intervals. And certainly the stress level does peak, but we, um, we know that the vast majority, so again, 60% of the pikas that were caught in Montana were um, alive and well the next year. So certainly they didn't, that the handling and trapping didn't affect them, didn't affect those guys. And we have no reason to believe that Colorado pikas would be more sensitive to that handling. Um, the reality is, so Chris Ray, my advisor, is pretty much the only person who is able to trap pikas and not kill them <laughs> as, as it stands right now. Um, she's very, very careful in the way that she anesthetizes them. So she, put, she basically puts them to sleep when she handles them so that the stress level isn't too high for them. The initial shock is, is stressful, but then she's very gentle with them. Um, other folks who have tried other methods don't have great success. Uh, the great news is the way that permitting works for scientists, those people don't get their permits the next year. So um, really, the, good, the people that don't kill pikas get the permissions to, to continue to work with them. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but <laughs> yes. What kind of anesthesia does she use? Oh, that's a good question. I could try to remember a name, but I would probably be 50-50 shot of actually remembering it. Um, she, I don't recall at this moment, it's, um, but she puts them... It's just, it's a substance she puts on the cotton ball, on a cotton ball in the cone, and yeah, mm -hmm, exactly. All right, good night to TV land. <laughs>